What if I told you that the way we go about building and restoring homes is all wrong and we really need to take a new look at it? That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I have a great guest to talk to today. And uh, I'll be talking to Bill Martin, an architect. He's at WJM Architect on basically every platform. He says, just Google that, you'll find him or wjmarchitect.com. <clears throat> and we discussed a range of ideas from preserving historic homes and re how revamping historic homes and restoring them to aesthetic balance, functional aesthetics, and doing all these different, all these things sustainably as well. How do we build houses in a manner that works with the environment around it and not just from the natural environment, the societal, economic, cultural environment, and also still works for the people who inhabit the home. And that's what we talked about is how do you get all these factors and balance them with beauty as well to create something that works for the people who are going to be living in the house, for the broader community, and for the environment. And that is in a tune with its surroundings in every way. That's what we discussed. And it was really interesting. I, I think it's a very fun discussion. And I learned a lot about sort of the nitty gritty of actually how things get done from an architect's perspective, but great history lessons as well in, throughout this. So definitely tune in and check out the episode here because I think there's a lot of great information to be had. And so definitely stay tuned. But also, if you're interested in these sorts of topics, be sure to subscribe on Conversation of Our Generation. Sorry, subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to the podcast, but also search Conversation of Our Generation. Subscribe on YouTube so you can watch the interviews there, as well as my book reviews. And I have the shop up on conversationofourgeneration.com. So if you go to conversationofourgeneration.com slash subscribe, you can subscribe there to get the courses. So for $5 a month, you can have access to the course on the golden mean uh, and what that means. So you, I had episode or class one came, came out last week and I let that be for everyone to see. But going forward, the classes will be only for subscribers and eventually will be able to be purchased on its own. So tune in there because the shop is going to be filling up with more and more stuff there. But right now my book is available on there. So if you just go to conversationforgeneration.com slash shop, you can check that out and follow me on Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. And also check out Bill uh, at WJM Architect everywhere as well. And share this, get with other people and let me know what you think as well. I'm always looking for different thoughts and topics and ideas. So definitely let me know as well there if there's anything that I'm not talking about, or I should talk more about whatever that is. But with that, let's hop on over to the interview. And so today I'm joined by Bill Martin to talk a little bit about architecture and uh, on a range of things, restoring old buildings, keeping old buildings beautiful and more. So thanks for joining me today, Bill. You're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> well, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and what you're doing? Uh, sure. Uh, I am an architect and a community planner uh, in New Jersey. I also have building inspectors licenses as well. I was educated at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I spent three years there studying architecture and managerial economics. Mm -hmm. I left Carnegie Mellon for Pratt Institute in New York City. My degree is in architecture from Pratt Institute. And um, after that, I went into uh, working for uh, an architectural firm, got my uh, license in New Jersey. I'm licensed in five states as an architect, including New Jersey. And uh, I mean, that's about my background. I've been uh, in private practice uh, since 1991, uh, but I've been working in the industry since 1982. So I've spent quite a bit of time mm -hmm. in this uh, business. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my concerns are mainly um, energy efficiency and how to reduce the burden of, of buildings on, uh, on the planet. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
Okay. And so what, so you said your main focus there is with uh, the energy efficiency, but do you focus in a lot on old buildings? I know that that's one of the topics that you talked that you mentioned of like restoring and yes. um, restoring old buildings and refabbing them is, is that a big focus as well? I mean, where does that play in? Yes, it all ties in together because the most sustainable building is one that is already in existence. Uh, the uh, energy has already been expended to create that building. Mm -hmm. So if you have an older building, uh, it, it can be repurposed for a new use. And that is uh, extremely efficient, extremely green, and extremely sustainable. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I, that's one thing that I think the people who are very big on electric cars and making sure they go buy the latest, you know, electric car for energy purposes, the best thing you can do is maybe buy that gas guzzling SUV that's used already because there's uh, as, almost as much energy goes into building that thing as it does in running it for the rest of the time. Well, I'm talking primarily about buildings because well, yes. a lot of effort goes into the expense of creating them. And there's a lot of um, fossil fuels that are burned during the creation. Mm -hmm. So once you have them there already, you know, why replace them with a new one when you can simply utilize what you've already expended mm -hmm. energy on? Um, I have other opinions about uh, electric cars. Yeah. Uh, I think they're wonderful technology, but unless you're going to charge them with solar panels, mm -hmm. you're still burning oil and gas, <laughs> make the electricity, and in some cases, coal. Yeah. Exactly. No, exactly. And, and that was my point was it is similar to the building situation where that thing that's already been created. If you buy a used car, just like taking an old building that's already there and reuse it, like repurposing it, the re, re the re, uh, I always say the recycle is the third thing, you know, it's reduce, reuse and recycle. It's if you want sustainable things, you have to look at how you can repurpose and fix things that are in existence first, because that's right. Right. That, that's very important. That is not to be understated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you make a point about the older cars. You know, when you create steel, you have to mine iron, and there's a rather messy industrial process that goes into creating the steel. So the steel that's in the vehicle is already in existence. So there is some uh, logic to reusing that, but at least recycling that, because once you have the steel, you can always melt it down and, and, and make something else with mm -hmm. it. When it comes to buildings, we also use steel in buildings, but you can also use renewable uh, uh, structural systems such as, uh, you know, wood, you know, things like that. Trees grow, you manage the forest, and you can get a continuous source of wood, which is a, a carbon sink, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to build your building. So, but if you already have a building in existence uh, and you can repurpose it, uh, that's certainly something that should be considered first. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, that's interesting. I, I, that's a really good point. I hadn't uh, thought of that from at least keeping those old buildings in good shape from that angle. I, I know that it's definitely something in the community that I see a lot in the architecture community on Twitter of wanting to maintain that local charm, that local character, and kind of keep the traditional look of things and not make it, you know, everything cookie cutter, suburb boxes. And, but to really look at how that's also a more sustainable, more just efficient way of going about it as well. It makes it more practical and less of a lofty ideal that you have to convince someone of, it seems like. Sure, it's less expensive. <laughs> your, your building's already there. Why do you want to knock it down and build a new one? Let's, let's mm -hmm. just use what we got. Or let's use what we got and add on to it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I like that idea. And I, I've seen a lot of that here in Indianapolis where companies have been at least maintaining a lot of what's there from old buildings and revamping them and reworking them. So it's, I think that that's a lot of these cities need that, that places that have maybe gotten a little run down and need that rejuvenation. They need a lot of work and rebuilding, but how are you going about doing that in your work? Like what, what does it look like to re restore an old building or how do you make those decisions on what you restore what maybe is a lost uh, cause potentially? There are some, there are, yeah. I mean, sometimes you can have a building that is um, completely non-functional for its new intended purpose. That, so it does, it does happen. I mean, you have, to, you have to take that on a case by case basis. And if you're going to remove a building and build a new one, 
you should at least try to make sure that the materials that you remove from the site, the old building, that those materials end up recycled. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that can be recycled from hardware to uh, framing to flooring. There's a lot of the moldings. There's a lot of things that can be removed and recycled. Now, there is a cost associated with that, mm -hmm. uh, but it prevents you from clogging up a landfill with a lot of materials that uh, could be used by either someone else or by you in the new building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so how, what, what's that process like of restoring some of those, like what are some of those challenges, I guess, that arise as you're restoring an old home? Not, I mean, partially even like just from an architectural perspective, but also from the, I don't know if it's the political perspective or the cult, like how, are there issues that you have with dealing with governments and when restoring old buildings and problems that you run into of regulations and things that might get in the way of that or costs that might get in the way of that? I mean, I'm, I practice mainly in Northern New Jersey, right, right outside of New York City. Mm -hmm. And it's a fairly developed area. So when you talk to people about you know, redoing and revamping existing buildings. It's not a strange idea to them, mm -hmm. all right? It's not like we're in some parts of the country where you have a lot of flat level land and uh, they're growing crops. And then, you know, they decide, builder comes along and decides he wants to build a uh, new group of homes. And he comes and he buys a portion of a farm from a farmer and he builds a street off the main road and then he builds his houses around. Mm -hmm. It's not like that here. Uh, there's not a lot of land left for that kind of speculative construction. So usually what happens is someone will come to me with a home that they have that they need more space or they want more space. And what I try to do is I try to expand that home in a reasonable and responsible way so that it blends into the neighborhood that it's in. Mm -hmm. and also resolves the issues that the client is having, that they need more space or they want a family room or they need more bedrooms or whatever it is that they need. Mm -hmm. But I always try to start with what you have. So you evaluate what's there and, and see how it can be modified in the, in the most reasonable way. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how I approach just about every project, even commercial projects are, are similar. You want to go in and evaluate what's there and then see how you can adapt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a few places here. In, so Indianapolis, we do still have, uh, like my wife moved here from Northern Indiana. And I'm like, yeah, this area, like once you get past, like, I think it's like 126th Street, I can remember half of that area being farms. And now it's, yeah. <laughs> now it's just building after building until you get to like right. 166th Street. And so it's definitely changed a lot. But then there's also been sort of, as we've expanded out, a lot of people, especially younger people, moving into downtown and some of the older neighborhoods and saying, I want to make this a good place. And there's sort of still that ability to walk to a strip of, you know, restaurants and st like small storefronts like you might have had because these, these neighborhoods were built really before cars. And so they're built for that ability. Right. Um, and... I've seen some of those rejuvenating and being restored and homes being restored. And some of them do a great job of being in keeping with the look and feel. And then some of them stick out like sore thumbs and it, <laughs> it's quite obvious. Like I don't quite, I, I don't understand how they do, how they, I don't want to say get away with it. Cause it's not like they're doing necessarily anything too wrong, but I guess, how do you balance the, uh, want to kind of maybe modernize things and also keep with the look and feel and the kind of charisma of a and charm of a local neighborhood. Okay, there's a couple of ways to look at that question. Um, you have to remember that there's nothing inherently wrong with modernism in in that uh, in that sense. Modernism is a hundred years old. So there are modern homes and modern buildings, and I'm modern in the sense of their appearance, uh, that are appropriate, you know, to be put 
pretty much anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have an, a problem replacing a traditional home with a more modern looking home, provided that it is done carefully and in consideration of the other homes in the neighborhood. What I don't like is when you pop in, let's say you've got these beautiful clapboard uh, Victorians or, or craftsman style homes, which I know there are a lot of in Indianapolis, and someone will remove one and they'll install a square stucco box, sometimes with no windows, sometimes with small windows. There's, you know, I understand the, the architect, the artist that's creating that is looking to create a certain statement in their uh, you know, building. But some consideration should be given to the buildings around it so that when you're done, even though it doesn't match in with everything around it, it looks as though it was appropriately designed to be where it is. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain sensitivity that you have to have in order to accomplish that. Now there are, you know, architects are different. Some architects, they want to, uh, they only design one kind of building and they, they're putting their stamp on the world. They're going to create these, whatever they are, whether it's modern, traditional, whatever. And they'll put them everywhere. And they think they're wonderful because they're creating them and it's their signature style. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I don't work that way. What I do is I go and I look at the neighborhood first. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I interview the client, I try to get at what they, what they want. Some clients want modern, you know, clean lines, geometry. Others want more Victorian look. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain cost associated with either of those. But I start with that because ultimately, the building you design is, is not a reflection of, of, of you as the architect that created it. It's really a reflection of the users, the people who use it, or the owner who lives there. It's, it's their statement to the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a fan of um, the aesthetic police either. <laughs> they're, they want to tell you what you can and cannot do. And I understand why they're doing that, because someone comes in, does something shockingly inappropriate, and then they feel that they have to regulate. I'm not a big fan of that either. I think that, you know, there needs to be a balance. And I talk about that balance in my work all the time. Mm -hmm. That That's, I think, a great way to approach it. Because, like, the ones that I'm thinking of is on our north side, we have a bunch of, an area that's kind of, Victor it's a mix of, like, Victorian, maybe colonial style homes and some sort of Tudor architecture. Like, it's all these old big homes that are probably all 150 to 200 years old. And then you just have something in there that looks like it belongs in like uh, Malibu <laughs> and it's like a glass box. Yeah. And you're oh, like, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. And it's just like, it doesn't fit. And, and it's one thing to have that maybe somewhere where, yeah, you have a neighborhood that's more like that. And you, but I, I do see a lot of them too that get restored and they have, a little bit different architect, like a little bit more of a modern look to it, but it's done right. tastefully and it's done within, right. they still have some of the ornamentation that kind of mirrors the houses around it and makes it blend in. And, and I think the big, most important thing you said there to me is that it's not supposed to be a reflection of the architect as it is the people who live there and the community that has to live around that. Because, right. you know, it's one thing for, I think there is an aspect of architecture that is artistic big time it's a it is a tremendous uh form of art but you're also not being commissioned to paint something that for like if someone commissioned you to make a painting and they told you what they wanted and you did something completely different or you did something that doesn't keep with the gallery that they're creating they would say that's not what i asked for and it, it's not supposed to be it's not like you're painting for yourself. If you do that, you can paint whatever you want. If you're Picasso and you're just painting what you want, you can. But especially with a home, something that someone has to inhabit, it has to really be made for their purposes and their, right. what it, that's their home and their abode. It has to be made for them, not for someone's ego or their own personal taste as much. I mean, you have to offer that as an expert, but ultimately, it's not made for the architect as it is for the family. I will often tell my clients that I always tell them, I said, look, you know what you like. Mm 
you know what you don't like, and I know how to put buildings together. <laughs> so between the two of us, we kind of do it together. Mm -hmm. The other thing you have to remember about architecture as opposed to, as you are talking about fine art and painting, is that you, you paint fine art, someone purchases that, and it either goes into a museum or it goes into a personal gallery. Architecture is a little bit different. Architecture mm -hmm. is the integration of aesthetics. It's also the integration of things like walls and ceilings and windows and doors. There's a lot of things that have to be considered as you integrate those things together. But architecture is among the most social of arts because it addresses the neighborhood at, at the same time it's addressing the functional uh, and aesthetic desires of the person who occupies it. So I feel that as an architect, I have a responsibility to look at the surroundings, look at the context, look at the neighborhood, also talking with my client and determining what they need, and then putting that together in a way that's aesthetically appropriate, whether it's a modern, style or a traditional style, but aesthetically appropriate, proportioned to fit the context of where it is in the neighborhood. To me, that's very important. And I, I live in a community where there are a lot of a different types of homes. I, my, the community I live in is a walkable community. I do, my office is in the town where I live. I don't live in my office, it's out of my house. Mm -hmm. um, but I accept to go to job sites to visit projects under construction. I don't really need a car. Mm -hmm. I do have one for that reason, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't use it that much. Uh, my wife and I very often are walking out our front door and going into town, which is just a couple of blocks away to uh, shop or get coffee or go to a restaurant. We have all of those things very close to where we live. And I, when I picked the town where I live, that is why I picked it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that was 30 years ago. So now it's become a big topic of discussion. You know, walkable communities, stable communities, communities that have housing at every income level so that you can move into the town at the, you know, when you're starting your career. And then if you want to move within the town, you can quote unquote move up if you want to, or add on or do. All. And when you, if you're going to raise a family, your children can afford to live in the same town in which they grew up. And all that time you're walking around, you know, pedestrian, bicycle, you know, things like that, all of that, that's all very important to a long-term stable community, long-term stability has a lot to do with the balance of economics within the town itself. But having a walkable community is just an absolute joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've found that personally. I'm not quite two blocks from where I can get to things. It's about a half mile or so to get to really most of the area around us, but we're right by uh, one of the big like bike paths that goes all the way from like yeah, downtown yeah. Indy all the way up to our suburbs on the north end. And yeah. so we're not too far from that. And there's a bunch of stuff along there that, you know, we can take our dog and go, you know, on a Saturday, have a beer and some food and right. like bring our dog with us and have him, you know, parked at the table. And there, there's, I don't know how many restaurants that we could walk to that do that. They're, you right. know, it, and it's, it's a nice, I, I still have to use my car a lot because Indy is much more spread out than the Northeast is. <laughs> um, but it is nice to have the option of, taking that stroll. I found that last year was the first time that my wife and I did that a lot more because COVID and it's like, well, it's, I'd rather just walk there because it's nice to get out and enjoy that sort of, you know, when it was nice out in the spring and summer, it was nice to just enjoy that weather. Um, and it's healthier. It's healthier for you to go out and get some exercise and walking is very good exercise. Mm -hmm. So it, it benefits you personally. Uh, and it benefits the community as a whole to be a walkable, bikeable, uh, reduced vehicle dependency environment. Mm -hmm. Now, I happen to live in a town uh, that has a lot of, uh, that is very walkable, but there are municipalities around me 
where you have to have a car. You, there is, it's just too far. No matter what you want to do, you can't walk. It has to be done in a vehicle. But I, when I went to choose where I wanted to live, when my wife and I first got married, when we were very young, uh, I didn't want that. I wanted to live in a place where I didn't necessarily need to rely on my car all the time. It's mm -hmm. not that I didn't want a car. It just means that I, I wanted that balance in my life. And uh, I'm glad that we did that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a joy. And now here we are 30 years later, and you know, everybody's talking about this idea of a walkable community. And it's not just for, uh, for younger people, it's also for older people. You know, they may not want to have a car anymore. It's expensive to have a car, it's a, it's a waste. So, you know, oh, I want, I want to live in a place where I can walk to the grocery store and then I can walk and buy a newspaper, or I can you know, walk in and get some food or a cup of coffee and then I can walk back home. So mm -hmm. you can't do that everywhere. Mm -hmm. But thanks to, uh, you know, the smart planning and a lot of municipalities, a lot of cities are, are thinking about this. It is, it's happening. It's, uh, it's happening right now. And it's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Where I live now is very different than where I grew up. I mean, and it's literally less than a 10 minute drive. It, I mean, so it's not really that far, but it's tremendously different. And that, that five minutes that I'm on the road, you get all of a sudden a lot closer to an area that's more compacted and walkable than where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So and it's, it's just a very different lifestyle for sure than I, than I had growing up. And not that my growing up was bad. We were in a tucked away neighborhood. So it was kind of nice. We could play in the street and right. run around and you're away from right. things too. So there was, there, there's benefits and drawbacks of, of both. That, things. that that's right. I mean, I grew up on a street where we used to play kickball in the street every day. Yeah. You know, and you know, so you'd yell car and then mm -hmm. you'd off the street, the car would go by. But the cars would come every what, 15 minutes. It was mm -hmm. not very often. Uh, but where I live now and I raised my daughters in the house, mm -hmm. they, they couldn't play in the street. It's just, mm -hmm. just too much traffic, mm -hmm. you know, but that's, you know, you live yeah. closer to where the action is. You're going to have more action to deal with. There's nothing, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. But I uh, very much like the idea of being able to walk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to remember, it's like, a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, walkable community wasn't an option. You had to have that. Yeah. There were no cars. Exactly. You're not going to get on your horse, but you know, I get that. But uh, oh, you yeah. know, well, in my house is, I mean, almost a hundred. Well, I guess it's it's a hundred year old house now. It was built in 21, and so I mean, my bathtub was is built was made in 1926. <laughs> That's great. So, it's an old cast iron tub. We got it refinished when I moved in. And the guy's like, this is the oldest thing. He's like, I, yeah. like, I'm, I got to send this picture to the guys because I've never seen anything like this. And so, um, yeah, it's interesting because as I've done some renovations on my house and, you know, we've done some stuff, it's like, I want to make sure that I do things that don't, I don't want to like, I'm not knocking down walls and losing these beautiful right. old arches in there that, so I can have an open concept. But I do need to update things. And you also have to work within the fact that my kitchen is a galley. Basically, it's tiny. And, you know, so there are limitations. But yes, but small and well-designed mm -hmm. is going to be much better than big and poorly designed. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned the, the bathtub because um, one of the first things that I, my wife and I did was renovate uh, one of the bathrooms. And I took out the 1950s tub and I repurposed a claw foot freestanding tub that I got out of another project that I was working on where the owner didn't want that. He wanted to get rid of it. And it was funny. It was in the middle of winter. So first thing he asked me is, well, what do you want it for? Cause he thought I was going to sell it and make money off of it. And I said, no, no, I want to put it in my own house. He goes, oh, okay, you can have it. I'm like, okay, great. So I had, the, it was heavy. Yeah. This thing is really heavy. So they carried it out and they put it in the yard. And then two days later, it snowed like four feet and it was buried somewhere in the snow and I couldn't find it. So I had to wait for the snow to melt so I could find it. So I could put it in the back of my pickup truck and bring it home where it sat in the yard outside in the backyard for five years, exposed to the elements mm -hmm. while my wife and I saved up money mm -hmm. to get ready to do the work that we wanted to do. But, uh, but you're right. You can, and there's an example of recycling, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that tub belonged in that house. My house was built in 1895. It's an American Foursquare. Mm -hmm. So 
that tub fits beautifully into the house. You go into the house and you see that, you would not know that that wasn't always there. It mm -hmm. looks like it was always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really cool to see. I, my wife wants to take the tub with us whenever we do move because- I would like, do that, yeah. Yeah, I was like, yeah, we might have to because it's pretty cool. But it it is, uh, yeah, I just think that it's worthwhile because when I was looking at you know, refurbishing, I'm like, I might pay a little more than putting in some like cheap, you know, Lowe's tub thing that you could, you know, like just your basic bathroom set uh, right. and all that, that would be cheaper, but is it necessarily better a and B it, it would have kind of pulled away from the character of the house. And I think that that's one thing for us is tried to be tried to keep with that because I think there's a, and I think a lot of people in my neighborhood have done a great job of going in and redoing houses through here that have kind of, I think what happened is the neighborhood aged a little bit and it's a bunch of people who might've passed on or moving to retirement homes whose kids are just selling off the house because it's easier right. to these developers. And they're doing a good job of do, revamping these and keeping with, I think the local character and they're all, you know, hundred year old homes pretty much. And it's, I, I do like that. That's, I mean, that's a huge part of why I liked this area for sure. You have to remember that communities change over time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now that we know that, you know, pedestrian, more pedestrian environment, a walkable community is better, they, as things change, they should be moving in that direction. You have to go back 60, 70, 80 years after World War II. Back then, the attitude was if it was old, it was no good. Mm -hmm. It had to be new. Because, I mean, look, look what we had. We had plastics now. We had all kinds of materials we never had before. We had uh, amazing amount of uh, industrial production. You got a brand new car every two years. If you had a three-year-old car, it was an embarrassment. Now, if you, but you see how people's attitudes change based on the collective consciousness of what society is going through. And that happens in individual communities as well as uh, the whole of, of, of society. So mm -hmm. that's what you're seeing when you see that. You see older people passing away and the younger people either selling those homes or, or uh, moving into those homes. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, some of their memories are coming through and they're making changes to update, but they still remember what it was like before. So they, they, they want to hold on to that little bit. And there are other people who simply want to remove and replace. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they'll remove and replace it with something that doesn't look too much different than what's there, but they just want all new stuff. Mm -hmm. Everyone is different. But ultimately, your home, your neighborhood, it's a reflection of society. It's a reflection of your neighbors and you. And your home individually is a reflection of, of you directly. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I try to make sure that people understand that because it's not about cheap. You know, if you want to build cheap, 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 then, you know, people are going to walk by and they're going to go, oh, they're cheap. Yeah. Because they, everything's plastic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I have a podcast I listen to. He says, be frugal, not cheap. You know, don't. That's right. you know, I don't like the word cheap. I prefer the word cost effective. Yeah. And don't talk to me about being cost effective unless you're going to talk about the aesthetic effect of what you're doing the economic effect of what you're doing and the functional effect of what you're doing. You need balance between all three of those factors. If you don't have balance, then don't do it because when you're done, it may be cheap, but it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of things that are cheap end up being more expensive because they need that's to be true. replaced. And, you know, that's uh, something that I've learned as I've gone through and uh, looked at some of the fixes that were done from the, person who inhabited the house before me <laughs> it's like a, you know not paying the electrician to have it up to code means that now the light in the kitchen goes out randomly even though the bulb is fresh um, be careful. You don't want to start a fire. <laughs> yeah exactly and so there's yeah so there's things like that that it's like now i need to look into that instead um so it, it in the long run a lot of times cheap becomes more expensive but i tell people i said look if you're going to do construction construction is very expensive you only get one chance to get it right so let's get it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and so one of the other topics on here that you mentioned was aesthetic balance. And I think this is something aesthetic balance and 
functional aesthetics and how that tie, I guess, how beauty and aesthetics tie into architecture is, seems like a very hot topic on Twitter um, and just around because I think people are rejecting the just suburban, you know, cardboard box or you might, you can have three options. You have like tan, taupe and beige are your options of this house. Right. And in Indiana, or especially, you know, in the suburbs around here, that's very popular. That's a very common thing. But I guess, how do you go about balancing those uh, aesthetics and fitting that? I guess you've talked a little bit about fitting it in the neighborhood, but how do you create a beautiful building? What, what goes into that? Well, there's, you, it goes back to proportioning, you know, the, uh, the sizes of the windows, the shapes of the roof lines, you know, if there's a porch you know, what are the qualities of the porch, qualities of the front door and the moldings, and if there, if you have shutters, if, if there are functional shutters, uh, there's a whole slew of, of things that need to be designed and um, proportioned. You know, that the width and the height and the length of things all has to be uh, looked at. And there's no one solution. So, you know, if you use modernist principles to create it, uh, or if you use, uh, you know, the Greek proportioning systems of the golden or the golden mean, uh, you know, you're going to use some type of uh, system with which to organize the building and create that uh, aesthetic proportioning. Mm -hmm. And you you should do that. I mean, all created objects should be uh, intrinsically. Aesthetic. I mean, what's the point in doing it if you're not going to do it to create beauty in some form? Mm -hmm. I I like that. I I guess then what would be sort of the differences in some of those principles? I mean, you mentioned that the Greeks have. I know uh, the golden mean there and how th their proportionality works. But how is that different <laughs> than from modernism? I guess it, my understanding of that was that there's sort of mathematical formulas that work and that are basically you just have those proportions and if you just follow those formulas they work how do you kind of stray away from that and get into different styles and aesthetics but it's not so easy to do that you can't take one set of mathematical principles and apply it across the board to everything mm -hmm. having said that i like to use the cubed root of five to one as a proportion when I design. I personally feel that it creates a, a nicer proportion than what the Greeks would call the golden mean, which is a 1.61 to one, mm -hmm. whereas the cubed root of five to one is 1.71 to one. So it's a little bit of a different proportion. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I generally use. But it's not, uh, it's not a rigid system. You have to, mm -hmm. you know, you limit it by the, the lot. If you're in an urban area, you're limited by the land. The shape of the building is going to be, it may be dictated by zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a more, if you have a larger uh, land area uh, and you're not limited by zoning, you can create virtually any shape you want to create. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not design in any one particular style. I have done uh, modern type buildings. I have done traditional type buildings and all the styles, Federalist, Victorian, uh, shingle style, uh, arts and crafts, uh, you know, even into mid-century modern. I've, I've done all of them. They mm -hmm. all have their own aesthetic appeal. Mm -hmm. um, so the aesthetic appeal is really a personal thing. It, it's not universal and it's not tied to any one particular style. And that's why I never tried to develop my own style. I never tried to develop a signature style because I like working in all styles. I want to make my clients enjoy the process of designing in whatever they want. I mean, some people, oh, my grandma's house was a Victorian. I, I want to try to capture the spirit of that in, in my house, even though the house is you know, a quarter of the size of grandma's house. <laughs> there are things that we can do yeah. to kind of um, tie in the memories of those proportions. So that's really what I'm trying to capture when I, when I design things. Mm -hmm. I like that you have more of a methodology than uh, a rigid, I guess, I don't know if I consider like a framework or because I think 
it so much today is it, I feel like we want to explain things in our 10 point plan to fix X, Y, or Z. Um, and it's normally not that simple. And so I think having more of a philosophy and a framework or I guess not framework, but your methodology of fitting it into the tying in the, uh, who you want, like who your, your clients wants with what's around it and the neighborhood um, and bringing all that together. I think it just makes a lot of sense. And I haven't heard other people talking about that uh, throughout. It, 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 honestly, when I'm done, when the building is done, some of the biggest compliments I get are, gee, it doesn't look like you did anything. <laughs> uh, which horrifies most architects. But um, to me, I take that as a great compliment. It means that I put things where they should be in terms of the gestalt of what someone thinks when they look at the composition of the building. Mm -hmm. So that tells me I put things in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of thought and a lot of mathematics, even though it may not be you know, written on, I, I don't show my work as they used to say in school, <laughs> but there's a lot of it in there. And you can, when you look at something that I've designed, you can see that there's a lot in there, but you, it's hard to put your finger on it, which is exactly the way I want it. Yeah. But, you know, but yeah. not everything I do looks the same. Uh, every project I do is different. You would not know one project from the other came from me unless you understood how I go about creating them. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you understand that, when you look at a project I've designed, you can pick out on a street which ones that I've designed and which ones I haven't designed. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. I think that's really interesting. I. I was also curious about, you mentioned here, functional aesthetics as one of the topics. And, and I was curious if you were able to, you know, give an overview of what that means and why it's important. Okay. Uh, overall, and, and, what you're trying to create in, in a neighborhood, in a city, in an individual home, is you're trying to create balance between aesthetics function and, and functions in economics. Mm -hmm. the, the building, and the, on the micro level, the building has to function for its intended purpose, whatever that might be, whether it's a store, whether it's a factory, or whether it's someone's home. Mm -hmm. There needs to be, things need to be in certain places. There's a, social, there's a certain social order that goes on within families that needs to be analyzed. Um, you need to balance that the function against the aesthetics you know, how big are the windows going to be where is the sunrise in the morning we want to capture the sun in the kitchen so we want to make sure we get you know, the aesthetics right and then of course the economics of it we, we want to make sure that we um, expend the resources uh, in a in a uh, uh, smart and intelligent way now you know a lot of people say well economics that's money I said, economics is not about money economics is about the efficient distribution of resources. Mm -hmm. So you, you have resources that you're gonna to use to create a design. You need to factor in that, um, you need to factor in that uh, aesthetic uh, and uh, economic balance in choosing the materials and in, in choosing how you uh, uh, balance them uh, so that you can efficiently use the resources that you've been given to execute the design. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into that also. So it's not just about, I want this bedroom here and I want that bedroom there. It's about, well, you know, let's put this one here because we already have an inside corner and that that'll give us less exterior wall. It'll be warmer in the winter. The sun rises off to the left. You'll get a little bit of morning sun, but you're, you know, you're, the person in this room is a late sleeper. So they don't want a lot of sun so that we can put the windows on the other wall. So th there's a lot of uh, thinking that goes into that. And you know, when it comes to a home, when it comes to your living space, you know, it's, uh, it's only recently that people have been consulting, you know, architects and designers regarding that. Most people used to do it on their own. Um, and 150 years ago, uh, there were no, our architects was considered a, you know, gentleman's pursuit, you know, uh, mm -hmm wealthier men with education would pursue architecture as a kind of a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then of course, in the mid 1800s, it progressed into something uh, more 
with uh, uh, H. H. Richardson and, and Louis Sullivan and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and H. Vandro, and you can you can follow it like a timeline through history. But if you were a young couple in the 1840s and you were newly married, you would likely be getting a piece of land as a wedding gift from either one side of the family or the other. They would carve off a little piece of the farm. Here's your land. Okay, now you're going to build a house. Okay, um, there were plan magazines. Now, I don't know if you know what a plan magazine is. It's a collection of floor plans and elevations that's, that's bound into a little booklet. They used to sell a lot of them uh, over the last 50 years. But 150 years ago, these things were given as wedding gifts to the bride. Mm -hmm. It was the bride that decided how the house was going to be arranged. It was the bride that decided what the outside details were going to be. Because it was the bride that was at that uh, time in society would be engaged in raising the family. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that was done through wedding gifts with these plan magazines and builders would seek out, you know, weddings to <laughs> advertise themselves mm -hmm. uh, so they could build these things. And, uh, and this has happened all across the country. So it's only recently that the level of thinking that I just described to you is actually being employed in the creation of um, mm -hmm. homes and, and, and smaller buildings. You know, larger mm -hmm. buildings were always uh, done by uh, you know, people who understood space, especially who had experience with larger buildings and such. Mm -hmm. But the smaller ones were, were not so much. So mm -hmm. over yeah, time, you'll, it increases the quality of the housing because there's more thinking that's going into the housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before it was, it seems like your architects were reserved for your churches, your government buildings. They, were, they weren't necessarily the ones who were setting out and you're saying basically designing that home. And I think that one point that you made of economics not being money, it's really, you know, if you ask, I'm an, I, that was my minor, is, you know, it's really the amalgamation of decisions by individual people. That's what economics is, is it's really, saying, okay, what are the choices that someone is going to make when they have, uh, when allocating finite resources? One of those is time. And at the time, time, time is a resource that needs to be managed. Absolutely. And, and so the wife for a lot of time, I mean, she was the home, I mean, or she was the homemaker and that was really a full-time gig. And now we have a lot of machines, especially since the fifties, a lot of the tasks and duties that were kind of that went into being a homemaker that took so much effort and management have been kind of automated away and that's why i think you see you know that's why a lot of more women were able to go into the workplace and things changed there but in 1840 they had to run the house the like the wife had to do that and the man had to go out and provide that, they had that division of labor right. That's the way society was set up at that time. Mm -hmm. And society is constantly in flux. Mm -hmm. And you see how it, it has changed and brought us up to today. Mm -hmm. So it's a different attitude towards design. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the services uh, of an architect are more highly valued now because people realize that they need to have a very high level of thinking involved in what they're building because the resources they're devoting to it are quite substantial. And again, I'm not talking about money, but it does boil down to, you know, how much money do you have to acquire the resources mm -hmm. in order to execute the construction is a valid concern in the design. It's not just form follows function. Mm -hmm. It's not that simple. Yeah. You can't leave economics out of that equation. It's a triangular mm -hmm. relationship. And you need to find balance between aesthetics, functions, and economics. And if you don't, mm -hmm. if you achieve that balance, it's a joy. If yeah. you don't achieve that balance, at some point, you will have to correct the imbalance, which is going to cost you more and provide you with a negative aesthetic in the interim and possibly functional issues, uh, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, you, you, you're doing this, you, you hope to sell it, maybe in either downsize or upsize, depending on which direction you're headed. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you don't uh, mess it up and then create something that's less valuable than mm -hmm. it really could be. 
So the services of architects have become very valuable for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a house that uh, some old mobster bought and turned into the most ugly. Uh, he bought up like three lots around where my parents live. And I, I, it's, it's made like national news. I, I, I'll have to find the link and share it to people listening to the podcast because it is the most absurd thing. Um, and it just is like an eyesore. Now it's like an Airbnb that you can rent out for your bachelor party because it is quite the interesting place, I assume so. But yeah, it, I think that, and, and the problem is it's, I mean, square footage wise and everything, if you built that thing right, it could probably be, you know, I don't know. It, it'd be a very pricey home, but because it's built stupidly uh, and very, and it's very ugly, you can't resell it. They, I mean, the, when he died, his kids were like, what the hell am I going to do with this thing? No one wants this. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody's different. I mean, if, if, you, um, if you have enough money that you've made legally and legitimately, <laughs> you're free. It's a free country. You're free to spend it as you wish to spend it. Um, and it's not that there isn't a balance in that also. It's just a different balance than someone else might want. Mm -hmm. So part of what I do as an architect is I try to determine what kind of aesthetic balance, functional balance, I call it a functional aesthetic balance. I roll them all into one term. <laughs> I call it efebism. If you read my uh, writings on my website, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means something different to mm -hmm. each building owner. Mm -hmm. And I try to determine what that balance is so that I can follow that balance to the solution to whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. They have goals and I want to help them accomplish their goals. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I think that that is just a great way to look at it and think about it. Um, and so I was curious, I had, I know we're kind of getting close to time here. So I wanted to ask you one final kind of two part question. And that's, uh, you know, my tagline here is solving the problems of today with the wisdom of the past. So mm -hmm. what do you see as, the biggest problem facing, you know, the biggest problem in kind of the architecture world, and what do you see as a solution for that? Well, I mean, everyone's talking about you know climate change and, and global warming, so that that's a big issue right now for sure. Mm -hmm. So you know, trying to manage uh, resources in the design of buildings is something that needs more attention, and I think that more architects should do that. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you an example, you know, 200 years ago or even 300 years ago, settlers would come here mm -hmm. and they would have to build their own house. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in parts of New Jersey where I am were among the first areas that were colonized and settled. You know, once they had purchased land from the Native uh, Americans that were here, uh, they started, you know, farming. Not all the land was suitable for farming, but they're building homes. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you look at the homes that are still in existence that date from that time, and there's still some around, they have stone on the south and on the west of sides of the house. And they have a big wide porch in the front. And the houses, regardless of where the road was or is, the porch always faced south. And the reason for that is in the winter, the sun is lower in the sky. So the sun would shine under the porch onto the stone and warm up the stone. And that warmth would make its way to the inside of the house. So what you find here is a real effort to work with nature, to reduce the energy required to operate the home. So they increased comfort simply by where they put the stone. And they put stone on the west and they planted trees that lose their leaves. So in the winter, the sun shines on the west and the sun at the end of the day is always the strongest part of the day. Heats up the sun, again, on the south and on the west in the winter. In the summer, the trees yeah, grew their leaves, shielded the stone, the stone stayed cool, and it was actually an early form of air conditioning. The sun is higher in the sky in the summer. The porch was designed to keep the sun off the stone mm. on the hottest part of the year. So you see a real understanding of the environment and a real understanding of how to build something 
to create maximum comfort with the lowest amount of energy usage. And they didn't have uh, access to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the large amounts of energy. They were burning wood. They were, you know, was something, and they wanted to be comfortable in the winter and they wanted to be comfortable in the summer. And believe it or not, these houses were. Without air conditioning, they were comfortable because mm -hmm. of the way they were designed and the way they were constructed. In yeah. the winter, the same thing. So that's the problem. I would love to get people in general, the public, more in tune with designing and building buildings that worked with nature instead of trying to conquer nature. That's mm -hmm. Western civilization. We're going to conquer nature and we're going to we're going to become victorious. And you can do that if you're willing to expend enormous economic resources. Yeah. But, but we don't have the luxury of that anymore. So that's my example of how the knowledge of the past can mm -hmm. be used to solve problems in the present. I mm -hmm. mean, I talk to people all the time. Nobody looks at the stars anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody looks at the stars. The position of the stars in the past and where the sun rose and where the sun set could be a life and death issue. Mm -hmm. It tells you when to plant. It tells you when to harvest. But mm -hmm. we don't live by those types of uh, rules anymore. Mm -hmm. We've kind of lost touch with the natural world. And even if you live in a city, the natural world is still around you. And, you know, if, you're, if your building is, is uh, built in, 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 in harmony with nature, in working with natural forces, it's going to use a lot less energy. People in there are going to be a lot more comfortable. They're going to be healthier. And, you know, this is where we can use the knowledge of the past to solve the problems of today. I love that. I think that is really interesting. And I feel like I could actually talk to you a long time now about permaculture and how that works with buildings, but I'll let you go because I know it's, you got to, you have other things you have to do and I probably ought to uh, get, I got to get this ready to go for tomorrow morning. So um, I know that you're uh, at WJM architect on Twitter and it's WJMarchitect.com. Are there other places that people can find you? You can find me on Instagram at WJM architect. And you can also find me on Facebook. If you search Facebook, you can find my uh, uh, architectural firm's page and it's WJM Architect there too. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty easy to find. Just go to Google and type WJM Architect in there <laughs> and it, you'll get a whole list of where I am. And I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere these days. That's nice. Uh, I, I find that my tagline's too long for too many places. So I have to always <laughs> figure out a way to squeeze it in different but that's awesome. And so definitely check out more of what Bill's doing. And thank you for coming on today, Bill. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. It was great. I don't know about you, but I found that conversation incredible. I, I just thought it was really interesting. Lots of great snippets and pieces of information there, but just a really interesting philosophy and approach to how do you build beautiful buildings that work for everyone, all the people involved and all the people who have to look at it and deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you do that? And how do you build really neighborhoods and uh, cities that make sense and add to not just the economic prosperity, but really the human element and work with what we want to, how we are built and our nature as human beings. And so definitely a lot of great stuff there. I feel like I need to have some more conversations with architects because I always walk away just astounded. So definitely, if you like this, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts on YouTube and head over to conversationforgeneration.com for all sorts of things. I have my library where you can check out all the book reviews. I have my courses now, so you can subscribe there to make sure you get notified as courses come out. It's just conversationforgeneration.com slash courses. But if you want to subscribe and support what I'm doing, go to conversationforgeneration.com slash subscribe. And when you go there, it's just $5 a month and you get access to the courses. You get all that stuff, any premium content that I have coming out, you get that uh, for that subscription. And it supports me and the work that I'm doing here. So head over there for $5 a month. For $2 a month, you will get access to extra stuff. You get my... Uh, you will get some of the courses, but not everything there. So still working on the tiering system a little bit, but 
you can for two dollars a month just support me and get part of the courses uh, or some of the courses and some extra perks as well like and then also anyone who subscribes uh, will get access to my discord server so you can join there lots of great discussions happening on there I feel like I've forgotten to mention that the last couple of weeks but it's I've started to add a couple of people that have come in we've already had some conversation happening uh, and it's really great so the people who are interviewed on the podcast if you want to talk to them I've invited all of those guys and gals to join me there so not everyone is on there but uh, I have invited them and the invitation stands so if you want to be able to connect with some of the people that you see here on the conversation for our generation just head over to conversation for generation.com slash subscribe and you'll get access to that discord server and other premium things as well so if you subscribe for the five dollars a month you get access to all the courses that'll come out and basically anything that I produce you will get for that five dollars a month for now at least until we will see if I really ramp up the production maybe things will change but for now you will get some extra stuff so definitely check that out and thank you for listening to this episode of the conversation of our generation let's get the dialogue going I'll talk to you next time